add me oh there we go we're here hey everybody we are fighting with the internet to get this to work let's see if we can get mike here do 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 Hi, two people that are watching. Hopefully, Mike has his link. We will see if that works for him. My internet currently hates me. So, let's see if Mike comes in. For those that were wondering, it's episode three with Mike Stefani of Mike's Monitors, who when Mike gets his link and comes on, we will talk to him. He has probably one of the cooler Varanid collections of anybody working with them right now. And of course, one of the episodes I'm really psyched for is the one where the internet didn't want to work and then the link didn't want to work and we'll see how that goes. And we lost a viewer. <laughs> I wish this would let me know which platform y'all are viewing on. I know I stream on the three platforms simultaneously, which is the cool thing about using StreamYard, but it definitely doesn't let me know where you guys are for the viewers, which kind of sucks. Oh, there we go. He exists. Awesome. I didn't know what I'm doing with this thing. There we go. I got you. How you doing, Bill? I am uh, on the run trying to deal with internet. Terrible. Well, better you than me because I don't know nothing about tech. It's all good, man. It's all good. All right. I, for folks that um, I've interviewed so far, I pretty much just want to hear about your collection, man. Um, I followed your stuff for a really long time, and you, since you, every time I talk to you, you always tell me that you're very tech, but you've become a lot bigger on social media now. Um, and the, the channels that you've made are really popular, and you're having really good success with all these different species. And so I just wanted to hear it from you. What's going on with the collection? How are things looking? What all the enclosures you build? I have tons of different stuff to offer to folks. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Um, you, you're kind of like breaking in and out a little bit, but um, I heard most of it. So, yeah, I, I, I've been breeding the uh, Mertens for, uh, well, I've had them for like, uh four five years and i started off with a small little pair they were probably yearlings um judging by my the hatchlings and yearlings that i have now um and they uh i got them from the tinley park show from uh johnny dragna i bring them home put them in a raise up cage and like for the first couple days they were out and everything was cool and then they just disappeared. They went down under the dirt, and uh, there they stayed for a couple of weeks. But, the, of course, the food in the cage kept disappearing, so I knew everything was okay. I didn't really want to bother with them. The cage was kind of rough to get in and out of at the time. Um, and then just all of a sudden, probably about maybe a month after I had them, they just they came out, and they were out tong feeding, and uh, they were doing real good. Uh, they were putting on size quick. So I built that nice cage with the Zupoxy with the 300 gallon pond. And uh, so when they were big enough, I put them in there. Now they're, you're looking at them. They're probably about, mm, I don't know, at this point when they started courting and stuff, the male was courting the female. It was probably about two years of, of having them. So 
uh, you know, I, I didn't never had Mertens before. I was always like a New Guinea guy. I liked the peach throats and the green trees and the black trees and uh, stuff like that. Uh, croc monitors. So um, uh, I put them together. They were in there. Everything was fine. He started courting her and I, I noticed she was swelling. So I assumed she went into a cycle because he was going nuts all over her. And uh, she swelled up even bigger and figured out she was grabbing. I had everything all set up, nesting, heated nesting and everything. And um, for some reason, she didn't pass the eggs. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was a nesting issue. I assumed it was her age because, uh, you know, when she passed, I, you know, I was searching high and low trying to find. Now I'm looking for adults. You know what I mean? And at the time in the States, there, there really wasn't a whole lot of them. So I asked the, the normal people, Ron St. Pierre and all the other, you know, Josh Ortiz, all the other big guys and um, nothing. There, yeah, there was nothing to be found. And then my friend, Bro Walters from the Internet, he hooked me up with a fish guy out of California who just so happened to have this pair. I throw up the quote signs, a pair of uh, Mertens. So he gave me that information. Uh, I contacted Bobby Rodriguez is a good dude. and. Um, you know, it's kind of weird that he's a fish guy and my wife, her family owns a tropical fish wholesaler. So we, we started. Oh, okay. talking. Yeah, it was cool. We hit it off right away. And, you know, he started sending me photos and and and, um, you know, and I had a male with, with Verandas are, are tough to sex visually, uh, you know, and, unless you know what you're looking for and it helps to have a male and a female to compare to, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Well, and I had the pair, so I knew what a female looked like. And of course the male with the hemipenal bulge, a little color difference in Mertens, you know, in their lip area and stuff. Um, and uh, so he kept sending me these pictures and I'm going back and forth with, you know, all kinds of people. You know, what do you think? They're like, yeah, yeah, it could be a pair. It could be. You know how it is. It could be a yeah. pair. So, and it was quite a bit of money. So, me and my wife, we discussed it. And, um, you know, uh, we said, all right, well, let's, you know, if we get one female out of this, it'll be great. So, I will, if we have to, we'll sell a male off, whatever, blah, blah. So, I get them home. And they're, these things were huge. They made my, my male they made him look like like a yearling again. That's that the difference was so crazy. So I was like really worried about putting them all together. So I took these two animals that I just bought, supposed pair. I threw them in with my male, and uh, my male and the bigger of the two females that we suspected was the male. I'm looking at them. I'm looking at them. I mean, you know, they're going at it, but there was a lot of dominance going on even between the females with sure. the new, moves, you know? So um, I'm watching all this action and I, I think I got like 23 minutes of the initial, um, you know, video of the initial introduction. And it was crazy. So uh, my male jumped on the big female that I thought was a male at the time in that big sucker turned around and opened its mouth towards my male. And he was, a, he was much smart, not much, but it was a big difference. So I pulled what I thought was the male out, put him in a separate cage and my male and the supposed female, they got along great. Everything's good. And so I, after they were all cool and everything in the cage, I went and I looked at the other animal and I'm like, why can't I see the hemipene bulge on this thing? I just, I couldn't see it. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, you know what, man, this is I, just like I suspected all along. Cause I couldn't see a male. I said, this, this has got to be a female. So I threw her butt back in there and man, it was on again. He was all over her and she was after him. And, um, you know, probably about 15 minutes after all of this jive, um, he started my male who was much smaller, started dominating this big female and they were in great condition when I got up with Bobby. So I, I suspect they were, you know, rare to go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the male, he was just all over her riding her. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of days later, we're real, we got dogs and my wife does a lot of rescue and stuff. So we're real close with our dog vet, dog and cat vet. So I asked him, I'm like, Hey doc, can he, can you x-ray these for me? He said, yeah, bring them in. So we x-rayed them. Turns out 
my original male is obviously a male and the other two were females. I was, Oh man, I was, I was doing a dance in that uh, x-ray room and he's like, Hey, that's good. Right. I'm like, yeah, that's great. You know? So, um, I mean, thank God that that all worked out that way. And they both been kicking out eggs left and right. And, uh, I, I hatched out like 49 this year. Wow. Yeah. And I just put in, and, and there's a crazy story too behind this is, um, and I just put 14 more in, in my, the, the smaller female, I don't name my animals. So the way I kind of tell them apart is I pick out little features on them and that's what I call sure. them. Well, the big, that big female has a tiny little kink in the end of her tail. So me and my sons, we call it kink tail and one has a straight tail. So that's straight tail. That's how we tell them apart. Sure. It's actually female one and two. The, the, the bigger one is number two, but so, um, uh, kink tail, she hasn't missed every clutch she's laid was been a hundred percent and straight tail. Her last two clutches, I think I got, uh, like two good out of the, out of her fourth clutch, two good eggs out of 12. And then out of her fifth clutch, I got like two more good eggs out of 12 again. So okay. something's going on with her. They've, they're fed the same stuff. Um, you know, they took a long break there. So it's not like I was overdoing them. Uh, Cause man, I mean, they're just, they're, they kick out the eggs like crazy. Um, but the, it, 262 days minimum of uh, incubation time. So that, that yeah, that that's it tests your patience because I'm not right. used to that. That's the longest eggs I've ever had. So um yeah, so it's good though, you know, it's like a test. It's like I used to worry peach throat eggs, green tree eggs, and I'd just look at them almost every day. Now with these, I put them in there and I basically forget them. I'll turn the light on in the incubator every now and then, just make sure everything looks good. And, um, just wait it out. It's all you can do, really. Right. So these are they're obviously in U.S. herpiculture, they're rare, right? And there's a pretty high price point. Yes. So now I've, I've watched your stuff for a long time and you've had success with all kinds of things. Um, and like you said, you know, everything I had seen from you and knew about you was Indo stuff. And right. you were really successful with it. Yes. So like what, what pushed you this direction? Mm. You, you know, is, I mean, they're kind of similar maybe size wise as opposed to getting like a full on Asian water, but like what, what drew you to these guys specifically? Well, um, going back to, you know, the beginning of my, um, you know, I, I've been doing animals my whole life, basically since I was five, I, my mom got me a box turtle for my fifth birthday and I've had some type of creepy crawly critter fish bird since. So um, I was breeding colubrids for a while and uh, rainbow boas. Of course, I tried a little bit of everything, um, but in the colubrid area, I settled on North American uh, desert rat snakes. And, and to this day, I love them. I just, I don't, I don't do them because with, with all that I have going on with the monitors, they're an everyday chore. And I just, you know, I just don't feel like to keep those North American desert rat snakes and rack systems, you know, cause I used to give them uh, 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 overhead lighting, overhead heating with uh, ceramic heat bulbs. And they were basically, you could make beef jerky in their cages. And, and I just don't <laughs> feel, yeah, I, they were, they were brutally dry. I kept a tiny little, um, uh tea light you know like the glass little tea candle things yep so that tiny little thing i kept water in there at all times i, I don't think they hardly ever drink any um they get all their water from you know their their diet but uh i loved them kept them for a long time and then i had some brazilian rainbow boa babies and i was at a local show um lee watson's animal swap yep. and uh Somebody had, yeah, well, you're from this area too. So you probably were at those shows and stuff. Yep. And uh, somebody came to me and they wanted to trade for one of my rainbow boas. And I'm from where I'm at, like the pet shop Noah's Ark and, you know, the zoos and all that kind of stuff. But I, I wasn't familiar with monitors at all. I just thought, you know, 
Savannah monitor, Nile monitor. That's pretty much it. You know, I didn't really know too much of any of the other monitors. So this guy comes up and he says, Hey, I'll trade you this peach throat for one of your uh, rainbow boas. And I was like, I'm looking at it. I'm like, yeah, what the heck? Cause I had a table at the time. So diversity on the table was no big deal, you know? So I, I traded him and left him on my table. He didn't sell, bring him home, set him up in a cage. And I was like, wow. I better do some research on this thing. It's beautiful. It was a beautiful animal. So I started doing research on um, peach throat monitors, and that just led me down a rabbit hole that I've been going down ever since. But, yeah, I was always attracted more to that um, uh, rainforest, uh, you know, foresty type uh, animals. And a lot of – with me, too, it's weird. It's like uh, the habitat and the setups really – spark my interest as much as keeping and breeding the animals. I just, I really like to like mimic naturalistic environments and stuff. It's, I don't know. It's almost like an artistic thing with me. My grandmother was an art artist. So I've always had that kind of eye and, you know, my rainbow boas, I never kept them in a rack. They were always in beautiful cages with plants in there and logs. And it was just really beautiful. And so that's kind of how I went in with the monitors. And then from there, it would, like I say, it was just, you know, Hey, you got monitors and yeah, I got spiders and I'm trading spiders for monitors. And then I wound up with that, uh, that really awesome, super tame uh, green tree monitor I had way back in the day. His name was G monkey. I called him G monkey. Cause he was like, it was like having a green uh, uh, monkey. He would sit on my shoulder for hours at a time, would never run away, even outside, he, he was like my buddy. So, um, uh, so I had him and then I, I started getting into, uh, I got a trio of black tree monitors. And so I just kind of went that, you know, that setup. that's when I was doing all the shower stalls and bathtub, and crew, which are great that, I mean, to this day, I I'm in the basement now with my collection and those are, those, uh, one piece bathtub units are, like uh, for new construction. So getting them down into the basement is pretty impossible. So right. I'm building my own cages now. And of course they're nice too, but for tree monitors, you cannot beat a bathtub unit. Greatest cage in the world for a group, for any type of tree monitors. <laughs> so w when you were doing the Indo stuff, um, was that, were you still looking to try and get captive bred stuff? Were you working on, cause I, it's, it's been a little while since I saw you when I first started seeing you. So the captive bread stuff was still pretty rare back then. And it even really is now. Um, so were you, you know, trying to work on imports? What, you know, what was your yeah, experience there? there? Yeah, there was, there was, you know, nobody breeding that stuff at that time going way back then. Uh, everything was wild caught. As a matter of fact, my trio of, uh, Bacari that I had, oh my gosh, they looked like if, if you took a piece of paper and drew a stick figure of a lizard with a really long tail with a black mm -hmm. pencil, that's what they looked like. They were, I was like, what the heck did I buy these things for? <laughs> they had some, um, uh, some dying spots on their tail, some like uh, necrosis or whatever you would call it. So I had a, you know, I had a, with a scalpel, scrape all that dying and dead skin off and then treat it. And, uh, you know, I, of course, I had a flagellate panicure, the whole nine yards with them, rehydrate them. And once once I got them all into that shape, it was just a matter of keeping them properly and, you know, uh, proper hydration, misting, um, heat, light hours and lots of food. And, you know, that. They just, they go, they, they breed and they breed good. And it's like, I, I don't, I wish I could tell you, oh, here's what you got to do. It's, it's, I always going back to those days when people used to say, well, you know, what are you doing? And it's like, and I tell people what I was doing. We were all greenhorns. I was, I would tell people what, what I do and they do it. And they're like, eh, nothing, you know, you know, and then after a while I started realizing, you know, this guy's in Texas. Right. Why is he keeping stuff like me uh, in Illinois? You know what I'm saying? It's 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 the the barometric pressure is different. You know the daylight hours, heat, humidity, everything's a little bit different. 
uh, although we're keeping them in controlled environments, those those dominant outside elements and, and forces like barometric pressure, you, you, you can't change that. You're, you know, you're not changing that. So it, I think you just, depending on where you're at in your area, you have to use your conditions to your advantage. Otherwise you're, you're fighting something that you're not going to win. For sure. So obviously it's super popular on social media right now with the Mertens. Um, but then now I've seen you posting a bunch of other stuff too. And so have you kind of kept the collection diverse this whole time? Have you moved, you know, in and out from Indo? I saw, you know, you had some smaller Australian stuff and I saw Kamingi and how, how have you kind of changed over time with what you're keeping? Well, back, back in those days, it was all about New Guinea stuff and the tree monitors. And I, I actually had uh, me and a partner, we went in, I, built the enclosure. It was 14 by eight by seven. And it was in my garage South facing in DeKalb, Illinois. And uh, this was a huge walk in enclosure kind of walk in. And when you were, when we were younger, you, you could lift your leg over the four foot wall and walk in there. But these days I, you'd have to push me through the window. <laughs> so, but what was really nice about this cage that I designed, it was, it was ingenious because in the summer months, I'd hit my garage door and the garage door would open and that whole back wall, you couldn't get in my garage anymore because the whole back wall was, was half wall and then half uh, hardware cloth. And um, the sun would just flood in the cage. And he, I built the cage and he bought um, 1.2 wild caught uh, Mindanao uh, coming eye. And these things were beautiful. They were beautiful big beasts straight from you know the jungles of Mindanao and they hated the white monkey they they hated me man <laughs> and I don't blame them you know they, they were big animals somebody pulled them out of the wild and they're sure. in a garage in decal Illinois I don't I don't blame them I'd be pissed too so um me and my partner we kept them and everything was going great. And, you know, they were real scared and skittish. And of course the cage was pretty decked out. So they hit a lot and um, he lived in Chicago. So, um, you know, we did a lot of, you know, uh, phone conversations and stuff. Wasn't a lot of video and you know how it easy is, is now. Sure. So uh, one day I'm sitting out there in the garage and um, I noticed the mail came out and one of the smaller females came out and like basked right next to him. And I was in the room and I wasn't moving. So they, you know, they seen me, but I wasn't moving. So I don't know if I didn't, you know, come off as a threat to him or whatever, but normally when they would see you, they would flee. So they're there. I'm just trying not to move now because they're finally both out in front of me. And, um, she parks up right next to him under the basking lights and I'm watching him. I'm watching him. I don't know. I get a little itch in my nose or something. I just, I make one little move and they just went bazoinkers bouncing off the walls. And then because they were so frightened at the time, the male grabbed the female by the head, just one clean swipe and her head was hanging by a piece of skin. Oh, so, man. yeah, it, it didn't take long. I mean, and literally this animal would we would go in there and I'd have to tell whoever was with me, hey, you got to watch that log over there. If you see any movement in that log, let me know. <laughs> so we're in there one day and, and they're like somebody said, I don't know if it was JC, whoever it was. He says uh, hey, he's coming out and. I look, and by the time I turn my head, here he comes. He's about a five and a half foot big beast of an animal, sure. and his mouth is open, and he's shaking his head back and forth, running at me. You never seen a short little fat guy jump through a four by four <laughs> hole so fast in your life. So I escaped from there. So what that brings me to is this point: uh, when I got back into um, monitors. Uh, okay, I love the coming eye. They're just to me, it's probably the most beautiful uh, monitor out there. I think personally that the, the highlighter yellow against jet black is just the contrast. You can't beat it. Absolutely. My, so um, 
you know, now I'm getting back into it and I see my buddy, John Adragna, he's captive breeding coming. eye. I'm like, holy crap, captive bred coming. eye. this is like a dream come true. So I bought two off of him. It turns out they were both females. And then after a little swipping and swapping, I wound up with a, another male and another female and then they're, they're breeding real good for me. So I'm on, uh, my, uh, I just hatched out the second clutch of this female and she's grabbing again. So, and they, they're awesome. baby. Yeah. They're just beautiful animals. So that, that now, then I got, after I got the coming, I, I got the, the Mertens and, um, then I don't know how I, I, I just didn't, I didn't have that. You know, I seen people, a lot of people were breeding the, the, the tree monitors now, and I had room for bigger cages and stuff. So, um, you know, I got some white throats. I got a really good deal from a couple of buddies on some white throats. So I got those, I bred those twice and my wife loved them. They were kind of not my cup of tea. It just, you know, I don't know. It's slow moving, you know, I, I just not my, they were great animals. Don't get me wrong, but I don't have a lot of room. So I got to keep what I really like. Of course. And they're basically the anti tree monitor. I mean, they're, they're nothing like it. So yeah, right. They're pit bull, bulldogs, bulldozers, but they, you know, they were really cool. It was great raising them and it was great having babies with them. And they're, you know, their little babies are just, you know, they're tiny and they come out thinking they're like Godzilla. So it's, mm -hmm. it's hilarious. And then they tame down. It's just a matter of a few months and they just tame right down. That's awesome. So, yeah, I, so I got rid of those. And then, of course, what pretty much opened the door for most everything I have now. And then I had the originally I started with um, one point two uh, peach throats to start that project again, because that was like my coup de grace way back in the day was um, captive breeding. I got three clutches out of my pair back then and hatched them. And I, you know, oh. I, I was young and dumb, sold them. I should, probably should have kept them. So when I got back in, that was the first thing I got. And, you know, I've been having troubles with this female and that female. I've gotten a couple of clutches. I've dug up way too late. They were dried in the dirt. So, oh, uh, you know, but yeah, but with everything else I got going on, you, you know, you kind of where you're, you can tell where your priorities are. Otherwise I would have had some hatchlings by now. But I've really been putting in the time and the effort with this pair. Uh, I, I normally I don't split my animals up, but for this male, he was really heavy. I wouldn't say overweight, but I suspect this might have been his problem. He was a little overweight and, uh, you know, he went through a couple of females. And then I had this one of my original females. She got a burn on her back, so she was out of commission for a while. Um, I believe they, I, my lights are all the same. So it's not like there's ever been another burn. What I suspect happened is um, this smaller female climbed on top of the back of the other male or female. She got a little too close to the light and in the kiss complex are real prone for, you yeah. know, uh, burns. So she took a little burn uh, and, and it took me some time to heal her up. And, you know, I was giving her antibiotics and sulfadine and all that stuff. So she's all good, and you know she's got a burn on her back. Uh, it's healed over, but man, she's a good breeder. I've gotten three clutches out of her. This is all within the last year. Uh, one I didn't find on time. The other one, I, when I did find it, they were in. I don't know if they're. I, well, I'm not going to say they're infertile because I don't know if they were infertile. They were just really. They were, they weren't good eggs. They were soft. They never firmed up, and. Um, so she just laid another clutch. It was only one egg and I put it in the incubator. It was looking good, but it didn't firm up again. So right now that pair is um, separated and I'm probably going to give them about another month, reintroduce them. Cause she's getting, you know, she's getting all swolled up again. So I want to make sure I get in there on her cycle. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping for those. Cause I mean, a, a captive born baby peach throat, man, that's a beautiful animal. I, I don't know if you've seen those photos of my oh, yeah. captive. Bird. Yeah, those are beautiful. I mean, you can't beat them. They're beautiful. Oh, of course. So, yeah, that's, so that's kind of where I'm at now. Oh, and then with um, the uh, Merton's babies, you know, um, like you say, they're a high tag animal. And I've done some swapping for some really good animals. So, I, you know, I've made some good trade deals and some good deals. 
And, and, uh, you know, I got this trio of Kimberly rocks and I never, never kept Australians ever it really wasn't really interested in them. I love them. They look great and everything, but man, I, and I always wanted the Kimberly rocks, but when I got them, they were so small. I couldn't believe it. I was like, Oh my God, I can't even believe this, you know, monitor is this small. So they were really tough in the beginning, um, you know, giving them really tiny little crickets and chopped pinkies and quails and real small bits. But it was just a couple of months and, you know, they're already probably a good 12, 13 inches. So they grew quick. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, when I originally – had talked to some folks and said that I, I wanted to try talking to you and, and try interviewing you. Um, it it's crazy to me that because I've been following your stuff since like the King Snake Forum days, right? Right, Which, right. There there might be people watching this that don't even know what King Snake Forum is. Uh, that's so, crazy. But you and and other folks from that kind of time frame in that group, like you guys had success with all sorts of species. And then now you have come back and you have a whole different group of species. Aside from the peach throats, you've kind of maintained that. Right. And again, great success. You know, it, you, you talk, you know, a couple struggles here and there, but basically you've continued to have success. You're keeping them. They're healthy. Clutches are popping out. Now you're just working on, you know, continuing eggs and incubation and things. But then like in the hobby, it, it just never seemed like monitors kind of maintained popularity. Like when we were on the forums and stuff, people were talking about your success and it was so crazy. Like, Oh, this dude's been successful with all these things. Right. Except you were, and it worked. So obviously it can work. And then that kind of faded to the side a little bit. And now a guy like yourself comes back and you're doing some other species. And again, great success. Like, so yeah. I, I know that it can be done. Oh yeah. It, it just doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't seem like anybody was consistently continuing it. And that's you just know, really weird to me. Yeah, it, it is because that there goes back to that thing where, you know, there's gotta be a formula people. I think personally, when it comes to monitors, people, think way too much. I think you complicate it, you know, by, you know, trying timing and, you know, uh, rain cycles. There, there's just a few parameters that you have to meet in my experience for this to, you know, kick off for you. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm not, I, I can't say like Ron St. Pierre, I mean, look at the stuff that guy's got outside in Florida. I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know what to do outside in Florida. What I do outside in Florida, I probably wouldn't work. I'd have to readjust, you know, but what I do here in, you know, Illinois, Wisconsin on the border, um, you know, in a basement, it's, it's cold more than warm. And when it is warm here, it's cooking hot and it's freezing cold. Um, and my stuff is in the basement. And um, I never, back in the day, everything be, was behind the scenes was hot. And like where my feeding station was, my sink, you know, the fronts of the cages. For me, I had it all air conditioned. Now I kind of do it differently. I keep them. We're in the basement and the whole room is hot. It's constantly 84 degrees. You oh, know, okay. uh, yeah. Like, like right now I, I, I try to explain to people in the winter time, my temperatures in the basement are hotter. I mean, it's colder outside. The basement is definitely colder, but I run my heaters to where the ambient room temperature is, you know, 82 to 84 degrees constantly, where in the summertime, I turn off all those space heaters and it's probably runs like 80 degrees to 82 degrees, just, just okay. because of the, you know, the comfort factor for myself being down there. Sure. 
Cause like, uh, you know, I start doing water dishes and feedings and stuff like at this time of the year down there, uh, I'm dripping sweat. It's brutally <laughs> hot, it's humid. It's, it's brutal, but you know, it, it's what, it, it's what seems to be working. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to fix nothing that ain't broke. Right. All right. Well, I do have a comment here. Some folks want to hear about your new group of Cayman lizards, which I also oh. want to hear about because they're awesome. Yes, man. I'll tell you, it's really cool about that. It's like, you know, I'm a little kid. I'm in the library at school. I'm supposed to be doing my math work and I'm reading animal books and lizard books and come across a picture of a Cayman lizard. I was like, geez, in grade school. So sixth grade and under. And I see that Cayman lizard and I was like, wow, that's really cool. I'm used to like, you know, I'm a kid. I got a nose and toads and stuff like that. And I was like, one day, one day I'm going to get them. And then, you know, as I got bigger and getting into this stuff, uh, you know, my friend, John Carlson, he owns a wholesaler here in Chicago. He's always telling me, yeah, you got to get into Tegu's. I'm like, eh, you know, it's just, it's weird. Like, like with the North American desert rat snakes. I mean, I had everything. I had mountain Kings, indigos. I had everything. And something about those North American desert rat snakes, just, it clicked with me. I love them. And, you know, when you love something, that's what you're going to do. So um, I never really got into the tegus and stuff. And um, probably, probably because that's probably why I don't like the uh, abigularis as much. Cause they're, they seem kind of more like tank, like lizards, you know, yep. they're not, sleek and fast and even though i've seen some of them wild caught uh tegus down there in florida chasing people off i'm like oh that's <laughs> crazy you know because i can't run no more so i'm i you know i get tagged i get it yeah so uh yeah and then you know i remember one time going to serpent safari here in the wisconsin dells and that um they had them in there they were big huge four foot animals green yeah, they did. Yeah, with that orange hat, I was just looking at him. I'm like, man, that's the coolest lizard. You couldn't get them. You could not get them back then. Yeah. So uh, my friend John Carlson, he rents space from my wife. Um, you know, he said, oh, I can get these, and now's the time to get them. You know, when they first start importing babies, you want to get in on that first couple shipments because everything after that, they hold them overseas a little bit, and, you know, they get a little sickly and they need some work. So yeah. I got in on the first shipment. I got four and man, they were, they're so cool. So cool. Um, you know, and again, now that's going to be a great setup when I do, you know, finish their adult, uh, their adult enclosure is going to be totally decked out with, you know, filtered water and just, it's going to be great. Um, Cause I, I just like that shit. So um so I got them and now I'm worried all oh, snail meat and blah, blah, blah. Well, you can go to the Chinese grocery store and get snail meat coming out your ears. Yep. So I got a bunch of snail meat. The first night I got them, I had no snail meat, but I had a lot of chopped fish. And I was just sitting there with them and um, being real calm around them. And I offered them some chopped fish on the tongs. And uh, the bigger one, one of the bigger of the four, it, it took it. And I'm like, oh, Wow snail eaters eating fish, you know, I wonder what else they'll eat. And, you know, I really didn't do a lot of research on them still really haven't. Um, but, uh, this, I have this one particular one. He, he's like a puppy dog. Now he, when I come into the room, <clears throat> jumps off the basking spot and he's swimming back and forth at the front of the cage, just waiting for me to hand feed him. So I've given snails, I give them the snail meat, I give them, uh, pinkies, uh, chopped fish, krill. Um, a few people told me, oh, I'd try some banana and, and blueberry. I haven't done that yet, but I will. Um, but yeah, I really like them. They're, they're beautiful animals and they come from a cool habitat, you know, flooded forests. And that's just, that's right up my alley. So I, I'm right. hoping I do well with them. That's awesome. So you've, you brought it up a couple of times and, um, I, of course, have been following your stuff since the forum days, so I've, I've seen a million pictures from you. Um, but you you keep talking about the enclosures and building the environments. And so, I mean, that's kind of like a, a second hobby or, you know, another huge part of the hobby for you seems to be 
building all of the stuff and decking it all out. And yeah, like yeah I, to me, don't go I, on, Bill. No, I I just remember you, you know following you on the forums, and then even really now, I I never really saw you post a picture of an enclosure that you just bought somewhere. Like I, you all, every picture I ever saw was some insane giant thing you had built. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's all full tilt decked out. Like, so what? Yeah. You know, is that obviously that's a big part of the hobby for you? But like, you yeah. know, have you have you always done it that way, or you just kind of found out you like doing it, or how did that no, come about? No, I've always done it that way. I mean, going back to you know in the day when when I was a kid, you know, my mom pretty much she never she said no to every dog and cat or i mean there's not much of a cat guy but every dog no you know as long as it was in a cage my mom didn't care so i had tarantulas and all this cool stuff but i never really had like money to buy cool cages and stuff and i'd always see whatever a council tv on the side of the road so i'd pick it up and kick the uh, the tube out of it and put a piece of plexiglass in the front. And then, you know, I'd go outside and find rocks and logs and, you know, just do the best I can for the animal because, you know, just, just looking at an animal sitting in a cage, you know, I kind of think, wow, what a life, you know, just to me, it's almost like prison. So give them some, you know, visual stimulizing, uh, you know, and it's good for you and well, for me, because then it's like, you know, I could stare in these cages for hours and just watch my animals and these, you know, uh, I don't fantasy, make believe habitat, naturalistic enclosures that I build. But that's always been a huge part of it for me. You know, fake plants. And it's just it's it's just to me, it just holds my interest better. It's part of it. It's like it all goes together as far as I'm concerned. For sure. So um, back in the day, it was full shower units for the tall Indo stuff. And yes. then now a lot of the stuff I see you uh, doing, you, is the is it Hagen? Is that the brand? Yeah, it's gigantic Hagen. tubs. So yeah, now you, you, and that, from what I've seen, like you're using the giant tubs as a base and then building up off them? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's, exactly, that's exactly what I do. I, I, um, now going back to the back in the day day, I was doing that with horse troughs. But okay. now you you got horse troughs that are, you know, whatever, oblong oval or whatever, and then you build a square cage on top of it. It's yeah, it works, it's great. And it, you know, you, a little bit of carpentry here and there, and you you um, square off the corners and then round them out, and you are you got a square box on top of a you know a racetrack style horse trough when i found these i was like wow everything's square and flush i don't i won't have no corners you know with plywood it just so that's what i did and and of course these hagen laguna tubs they're made for i don't know i would imagine like koi breeders or maybe red tail catfish breeders you know somebody who needs a big big uh tub and they're really really reinforced around the rim they bow out a little bit in the centers because they're, um, you know, poly, probably propylene or whatever they are. Um, but the, the rims are like four inches, rim after rim. So there's a series of rims and they're real wow. strong at the rim. So I'm looking at it. And I'm like, OK, I, I could build that up, but they're only five foot. So I'm like, well, I want more room than five foot. So I was like, okay, well, a sheet of plywood laying down, that's eight foot. So I got three feet. What am I going to do with three feet? So I build a cage and that three foot ledge, uh, a large mortar tub fits there perfectly. And what that also gave me was that shelf with no tub underneath it. All my plumbing is right underneath the one side. So, okay. you know, with animals like um, peach throats and water monitors, they, they poop in their water. So, yep. You know, if unless, you know, in, back in the day, I, I would just pick up the tubs and waddle around the, the room, splashing water and dump them and fill them. Well, you know, then you sometimes you'll you'll get a little lazy. You'll let them go a day. You let them go two days. And that with monitors, that's that's not good. Yeah. Uh, you know, when they poop in their water, mine poop almost every day. So. Um, so I went with the two inch drains. I just opened up a valve, ran everything to my um, sub pump in the basement. I nice. filter, I, I filter that with a spaghetti strainer 
So, you know, I don't get um, little wood particles and chips into my sub pump. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's, I replaced the pump once no more than you would in any other house, you know? So um, it's not real taxing on it. It works great. And my water dishes are nice and clean. That's awesome. So that, that's how that design worked out. And then um, from there with the peach throats, I went completely the opposite. The tub is 300 gallons full of water and the three foot area, they make a smaller tub that fit on there. Perfect inside the eight foot enclosure. So building them, you know, I always try to make things simple. I'm not a, I'm not no genius. And, you know, I don't want to go eight foot, you know, six inches. Cause then you got more cutting and framing to do, you try to make everything eight by four, eight by four. And it's just cutting one piece of plywood. And I put a uh, two by two rim around the whole thing. It sits right on top of the, the uh, tubs. Okay. And then I, and then the three foot side, I put a couple of legs on it and then just frame them all in with uh, paneling or whatever. But uh, so that's how that worked out. And um, yeah, that's, it's a, that was a fun build that Merton's cage. So um, I also see you post a lot um, about the epoxies and stuff you use to seal everything. And yes. you have, you have a specific brand that you prefer that, cause I, I see you post about it all the time and it seems yeah. to be really successful for you. Oh, it's, it's good. It's great stuff. It's called, um, Polygem makes it. It's, it's called Zoopoxy. It's designed and developed for use in zoo exhibits. So, um, cages, I mean, they use it for birds of prey, uh, everywhere from, you know, big cats, small cats, birds of prey, everything, you know, there's a lot of zoos that, um, are on Polygem's, um, purchasers list or whatever you'd call it. And a friend of mine had turned me on to it. My friend, Steve Sandin, he's a real good, he's artistic too with this stuff. And um, he showed me what he had done and he has for his Mertens, he has, I believe it's called Pentair makes the product. It's a, it's a fiberglass tub with a window already in it. So when I seen his and he, what he did with the Zupoxy, you know, I started talking with him and, you know, and I'm like, oh, I really want one of them tubs. And I don't know. He, I think he said he found his in the state somewhere was already here. But all the ones that I was finding were, I forget, the, you see it on the Internet all the time, somewhere from China. But they ship it and, you know, they bring it over in a big uh, slow boat from China, whatever. It costs a fortune to get it here and it's pretty expensive to begin with. So. I'm like, yeah, I got a hat. I got, I want a pond with a window in it. So here I got the, the 300 gallon Hagen Laguna tub. And I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, I'm going to make that tub. She's like, Oh my God, if you cut it, we can't return it or what? I mean, you take a water tub and cut a hole in it. You ain't, you're stuck with it. Yep. I'm like, I can do this. I can make this work. Um, now with, with the, polypropylene or whatever those tubs are made out of. It's almost like a PVC where you, you can't get a lot of glues to stick to the stuff. So, right. so the first time I, I, I take the grinder out, I cut the line across. I mean, it's a five foot tub and I cut, you know, four and a half feet out of the front of the thing. Oh man. <laughs> I'm like, this has got to work now because if not, I got to, <laughs> what am I going to, you know, what am I going to do with it? I can't do anything with it. So um, yeah, I cut the hole in it and I sat back in my chair and my sons, cause my sons always help me build stuff. Hey, Angie, Dom. So um, I go get a piece of Lexan plexiglass, whatever you want to call it. In this region, we call it Lexan. It's all pretty much the same. Yep. Um, the, the, the heavier stuff, not that cheap, flimsy plexiglass. So I got it and, you know, I'm thinking, you know, his cage is beautiful. It's, it's all framed on the inside with fiberglass and you don't see nothing. So I'm like, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll drill holes through the tub, through the PVC, uh, through the uh, plexiglass Lexan, and I'll bolt everything and put silicone on it. So I do that. 
I, I put so much silicone on this thing. It was unbelievable. And bolts, clean through it, nuts and bolts, tighten them down, not too tight to crack it, and uh, start filling it. I, you know, it takes a long time to fill 300 gallons with a garden hose. So I'm filling it. It's going up. It's going up about halfway. I'm like, hey, things are looking good, you know, and it took, you know, it took an hour and a half. I'm going upstairs. So I leave the the thing running. I go upstairs. Well, my, you know, my legs are bad and I got to go down a bunch of stairs. So my daughter, Sarah, was here. I'm like, hey, Sarah, go check that tub, will you? So I hear her footsteps going down the stairs and then I hear him boom, 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 coming running up. I'm like, oh, crap. She goes, dad, dad, you got to crack in the window. I'm like, are you real for real? She goes, yeah, I'm not joking. My kids joke with me all the time. It's just the thing, you know. Uh huh. So, ah, man, bunk, bunk, bunk. I'm going down the stairs. And I'm looking, and where where the bolts are around the, around the top, I'm getting these tiny little cracks. And now I'm about three quarters of the way full. So there's good over 200 gallons of water in this thing. And I'm watching this crack going. Oh, man. Going. I'm like, oh, got to stop. So I stopped the water, and I drained it. And I'm like, oh, my God, Karen's going to kill me. She's going to kill me. I ruined this tub. <laughs> so. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. And I just started working with the Zupoxy. And in the Zupoxy is a two-part epoxy. You mix A and B with some thickener, and you make it like a putty. You smear it over. It'll This stuff sticks to anything, almost anything. And, um, and by the next morning, it's hard as concrete. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to drill into the glass because it'll get the micro cracks. So what I did was... I got a new piece of glass, fit it in the hole, silicone the crap, cleaned everything off, silicone the crap out of it, literally. I mean, if you've seen the inside of this thing, you'd be like, oh, but there's a lot of silicone on it. Then once I got it silicone, I took a um, two by fours and I made a T and against the back wall of the tub, I put the heel of it and I put the T across the front of the glass to hold it in place with, uh, you know, with, with what I perceived as like 200 gallons of water in there. I bowed it out about that far to hold it in place, you know, and so it wouldn't, there wouldn't be no movement. So when I did that, I'm like, okay. And I took the Zupoxy and I ran a nice thick bead all around the edge of it to hold it in place. The next morning, go down there. Everything's holding up. Everything looks good. Everything's dry. I take my tea out of there. And nothing moved. So it's already set for about 200 gallons of uh, pressure in it. Um, so I fill it up. I get it all to the top. It's holding. I've, I get the cage going. And everything was good. It ran for, it ran for uh, probably about a year. And I sprung a little leak. So... With this little leak, I of course I reached in there with some more polygem epoxy and I plugged up where you can see, uh, like the pressure pushed the the polygem past the uh, silicone a little bit, made a little pinhole. Okay. So I, I'm you know I know my friend Steve Sandin, he, he works with a lot of different epoxies, like the the marine epoxy paints for repairing boat hulls and yep. you know, and I never you know never really looked into that stuff and he told me about it so i ordered some of that um what the heck is that it's a west systems epoxy another two-part epoxy but it's this is like um like liquid so this has to be painted on where the zoopoxy is like a putty okay so i painted all around the edge of it and then i put some fiberglass uh strips you know the the, the fiberglass material Yep. I put some strips around it and I painted it again and it's been holding ever since and it's rock solid now. So I don't really worry about it at all anymore with those two products. Um, so, yeah. And, and then the Zupoxy is just, you know, you can create what well, you've seen. I, I did all those um, like rocky outcroppings from the uh, iron ore cliffs of Australia. Yep. And I made a couple other, you know, really nice ones and I'm, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, man, I got to be able to do more with this. I, I, you know, not everything I have is Australian. So, sure. you know, I, I need something more. So then I started with the, um, when I did that show in St. Louis, I was like, I'm not bringing my animals and keeping them in deli cups or whatever. 
I've always been that way. Like even when I had my little stand at Lee Watson's, I, I took um, shipping crates and made a table display out of it. All little spots for my spiders. Everything had a place. It was all organized. I put vines on it, painted it up real nice. So I wanted to do something like that for, you know, my, my monitors, you know, I just, it's, so I came up with the barrel idea and I, I took two barrels and I cut them open and I made a couple of, I made one for my Mertens, one for a coming eye and then one for like, you know, Australian deserts, Ackies. I was hoping to have at the time. I, I, I have the Ackies now they are just starting to breed. So, uh, but I made those three beautiful displays and uh, so, yeah, that that's, you know, the, the polygem zoopoxy. When I was doing that with making those, uh, you know, iron ore, uh, rocky outcroppings, you know, I was like, man, come on, I'm better than I, I could do more than one style. So I started researching, like, you know, how to make other type boulders and rocks and stuff. And and I came up with some good ideas and for, um, you know, logs and stuff. I heat bent some PVC to make a log, put the zoopoxy on it, stamped it with a, a baker stamp, like tree bark, and then paint everything. Uh, really? Yeah, bad, beautiful. You can see that one, uh, um, the one barrel enclosure I have. It's like a river scene. It's yep. It's got, yeah, and that's, there's a tree in there that I, I built that all by hand. It, it looks great too. And I love painting it and trying to do the best I can. That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, you're right about the Zupoxy. Uh, Steve had started a, a Facebook page. You should go over there and join it. It's, I think it's called Polygem Zupoxy Vivarium Construction. Nice. And now people are on there and, you know, there's people that have great ideas and we're sharing them all and, you know, that gives me other ideas. Uh, of course, I always go with the Zupoxy. I really like the product. It's it's a, it's a forever product. It's not like, you know, um, grout, which there's a lot of chemicals that can leach in the water that harm fish and amphibians, you know, more yep. delicate animals. So that's why I like the Zupoxy. It's totally non-toxic. You can do whatever you want with it. And, um, yeah, it's beautiful stuff. That's awesome. So um, when you are, are building things, especially like I, it makes me think about like the barrel displays and stuff. Um, when you're painting things, what kind of paint are you using? Because like a, all the animals we're talking about, pretty they put a pretty good beating on their environment. Um, so what are you using for paint for your stuff? Um, well, I use acrylic paints and um the acrylic paints that i use are just craft you know you can get them at hobby lobby okay and um and you know you you mix colors you can get it you can make whatever you want you know color wise by mixing and or straight using just using straight acrylics without mixing and blending colors but um yeah it, it's the the zoopoxy takes the acrylic paints well uh, like my uh mertens the big cage is it's almost four years old now and, and I don't need to repaint it, but I am going to go in and repaint it because after I made that one barrel with, it's really orange. Yep. I didn't want to go that orange at first. Cause I was afraid, you know, I, I didn't want it to look stupid or whatever. Cause I've never done it before, but after I'd done that one and made it ridiculous orange, my wife said that looks ridiculous. I'm like, it looks just, I'm of course I'm using photos of Australia as reference. I'm like sure. it looks just, it looks just like that She goes, it does, but it looks ridiculous. I'm like, I don't care what, you know, what people think it's, I want it to look like it's supposed to look right. So after I got that, it's beautiful. Um, at the show, John and Dragon, gave me a few baby Ackies to put in there, you know, just to sell for them or whatever. And man, to see them little guys running in there on my little rock shelves and then with the beautiful little plants in there, I was like, man, as soon as I get home, I got to change that Merton set up. And I haven't yet, but now that I'm between clutches on them females, what well, now's my opportunity. So I'll probably right. start like after Christmas. That's and awesome. then I, I have uh, some Kimberly rocks I've been raising and I have some adults coming in and I'm going to, I'm, I'm blowing that cage out too. So <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so 
not really sure how to phrase it. So like you, I'm not trying to make fun of you for being old, but you've been in the scene for a long time, man. Yeah. And you know um, tons of people and you have a lot of connections and just kind of by virtue of time, like the folks that you know and that I know from monitors, you know, well, all the way back in the King Snake Forum days, if you're still in it, you're, you're serious about being in it, you know? Oh, yeah. um, so now because you're having such success with the Mertens and you've added a few things here and there, like it just by virtue of who, you know, it kind of gives you access to really whatever you want species wise. Um, are you, do you think you're going to expand more? Or are you going to kind of hang where you're at or what are you, what are you thinking? Yeah. I there, you know, everybody's got their little dream species, right? And there's a certain guy out there that um, has um, Lanthanatus uh, borneensis, and he ain't giving them up. But uh, <laughs> well, he's got the mail now. But I just met another guy who's got quite a few um, in the states. And you know what? Like you say, I know a lot of people. I don't know where this guy's finding these. I I, I don't know where. But that that's definitely something I'd expand for is the uh, earless monitors, you know, from Borneo. Definitely, you know, Spencer's. I'd, I'd love some Spencer's. Um, but that's probably it. I'm really happy with these dwarf Australians right now. They're really um, they're comical. They're fun. I don't need a ton of space. I don't have to break myself building these big, huge cages. You know, everything's manageable. Right. So I'm kind of... You stick with this a little bit, but if, if any earless ever come around, I'd definitely go that route. Okay. I think it's funny that you have, you have such a specific, like highly aquatic, super built out filtration, hundreds of gallons of water, like all this crazy stuff. And then desert. Yeah. <laughs> as dry as it gets baking these things like clay and, yeah. and you both, I, I, Lanthanotis, and it's like, all right, well, that's a swamp dragon. And the yeah. other one you'd say is Spencer's, and it's like, you could cook eggs on the rocks they bask on. Like, that's so different. That is crazy, ain't it? But certain things, you know how it is. Just certain certain things just tickle your fancy, you know? Right, it's what you like. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, a lot of it has to do with what kind of naturalistic habitats I could come up with. To me, that's, that's a huge part of it. Like, I so enjoy when people come over and they're like, Oh my God, it's like a zoo down here. It's better than the zoo. <laughs> that, that's a win. That's a win for me. Eggs, hatchlings, whatever the case may be. If people can come down here and just be blown away by the animals in these habitats, that's a win for me. Yeah. I get it, man. Yeah. So we have a Facebook question that says, Hey Mike, what do you have in the incubator and who are you expecting to lay? Oh, wow. Well, um, I expect my, I have a female King Gorm. This will be her second clutch. Um, her first clutch. I'm embarrassed to say I'm, but I'm used to working with big eggs. I was uh, trying to dig up her eggs and I'm, I'm digging around and, I didn't see nothing. So when I started putting the sand back, you know, it back in place, I found an egg, two eggs, and they were oh, a little no. rolled around and mixed in with the sand. So I, they weren't popped or anything, but I put them in the incubator and they just a few days, they went bad. So sure. she's grabbing again. So I'm putting some Kings. I would imagine at least two um, King Gorums, which I love them little guys, man, they are so cool. So, King Gorums, um, I got going in. I, my Aki's just started breeding, so I'm probably maybe 20 days away from putting a clutch or two in the incubator of those guys. And, of course, uh, my female coming eye, she's gravid, getting ready to lay, so I'll put another clutch of hers in. I have um, a 14 egg clutch of Mertens in the incubator right now and then two or three randoms. And I just pulled out two coming eye clutches, and um, they're I sold both clutches. They're gone. So, wow, yeah, yeah, they're hot, man. People love them. So, what are you using for an incubator? 
Oh, that's funny. When I when I started getting back into it, um, I'm old school, man. I I I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I get, maybe I'm a glutton for punishment. I don't know. Uh, you could buy cages. You could buy. <laughs> you could buy. But I just never yeah, did but they ain't it. Gonna look way. like that, man. No, I never did it that way. So my wife, she's the buy it. And I'm like, oh, my God, look how much money that thing is. I could build it. I find it cooler on the side of the road and do it myself for half the price or less. So she convinces me to buy it. And so I buy this incubator. I throw my first clutch of coming eye in there. And I'm not going to name the brand. Um, I'm not going to name the brand. It's a great incubator for snake eggs. But with my experience with veranda eggs, it's no good. So I, I plug it in. I, I you know, turn the heating element on the, the um, uh, my thermostat and it comes with a computer fan. Well, I didn't buy the giant model. I just bought the, you know, I don't know, maybe it's like two by two by three feet tall. And I put my coming eye clutch in there, the very first one, everything's going good. There's no mold on my eggs. Everything's going good. And um, one day I decided to pop the top off of my uh, SIM container, which there's a shameless plug. SIM container, eggbox.com, that, that is a product for the ages. That's a great, it takes all the guesswork out of wing, perlite, and, you know, uh, vermiculite, all that stuff. Put them over the water, put them in your incubator, forget about them. Great product, John. Um, so, again, it helps to know a guy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I've known him a long time too, and, and you know what? He deserved it. That's a great product, man. Oh, you yeah, can't, for sure. Yeah, it's a great product. But it, so, but same way, man. Like eat, for a dude like yourself, you know that mm -hmm. dude has been around forever, and then he made something that people who are into what we're into were like, "Oh yeah, man that that fills a problem we had." Yeah, that, that dude does what we do and had the same problems we have. Yep. And he figured it out and he came up with a great product. Um, so I, I put him in the incubator and the computer fan is over the top. It has no controller on it. And, you know, I don't know. I'm just getting back into it and I got a coming eye clutch in there and everything's going good. It looks good. So I open it one day and I'm looking at the eggs and I'm like, man, something just ain't right with these eggs. So I took them out and I put them on my table and I'm, I'm touching them and, man, they were, they were friggin' hard. They were, they were really, you know, they weren't pliable. They were, they weren't molded or anything like that, but they were really hard. So I figured out what the heck I, I put some, I put a blockade over the fan so it would distribute it rather than blowing right on top of the egg box, which is covered, but it really, really dried out my incubator. And these eggs, they went full term, never hatched. I cut them open. There's all my babies in there. And I, what I suspect happened is the eggs just didn't retain any of that moisture. Uh, they weren't pliable. And I mean, I had trouble getting in there with a razor blade. So I don't know how that little baby with his egg tooth, you know, would have yeah. gotten that's not coming so, the other direction. Right. So after that, I said, Karen, this thing's got to go. I know this ball python guy. He bought it. He did some work for me. And uh, so he took the incubator out of here. And I'm on Marketplace looking at um, old beverage coolers. And I found one that was for beer. And, you know, it's, it's the... the the kind you go to 7-Eleven and you slide it open, you grab a Coke or a beer or whatever. Yep. So it's the double doors that slide. It's like um, maybe four feet tall, two feet wide, three feet, you know, end to end. Put my heat tape all around there. The computer fan with a dimmer switch on it. And I run it really, really slow, but it's a much larger incubator. So the little bit of air movement I have in there doesn't affect anything. Just keeps the heat moving. Okay. Um, and that, that's, that's the way to go. I mean, people ask me all the time, Oh, what's the best brand incubator? I'm like, make it. That's the <laughs> best. Brand. Make it. It's not hard. For sure. And then I got another Facebook question. Uh, this is from actually from Scott Iper, who was commenting earlier, uh, in his very annoying Australian way of saying how, oh, Mertens are cool. I kept those outside cause I'm from here. So yeah. I'm very jealous. Very jealous yeah. of him. Yeah, um, he's a lucky dude. 
he said, what is the one species you wish you jumped on when you had the chance? E.g., what species was available then that isn't available now? Well, I, I don't, it, that's a tough, there's so many that I like, but what really fulfills me is my Mertens because I, I have the giant water feature I keep, and this is going to sound crazy, but I'm going to do it. I keep um, fire mouse cichlids in there, which is my favorite cichlid. I keep some Denisoni barbs in there that are some, they're kind of rare uh, barbs. I believe they're from India, but they're very expensive. And I got some from my wife that were just little tiny. And now they're, you know, four or five inches torpedoes. And, you know, I get For sure people who say, hey, you want to sell them? I'm like, no, I don't want to sell them. I love them. And, and then zebra danios I keep in there as well. And there's a, all, all by, you know, circumstance, I figured this out. Okay. The Mertens could catch everything in there. They can catch everything in there. Between the three of them, they can empty me out. Oh, sure. In, couple hours they could take all those fish they don't because i keep them pretty you know satisfied as far as feeding goes and why chase a fish when this stupid monkey is going to give me something on a stick you know exactly so they wait for the feeding but i but i have it's it's a beautiful ecosystem you know what i mean um i run it like a fish tank so i have biological filtration mechanical filtration um and it runs it runs good um, it's beautiful to look at it when the lizards are basking and they're not doing nothing. The fish are down there breeding and they're, you know, doing their thing. And um, the, the, so I'm really satisfied with my Mertens, but I'm going to try one little trick with them that I've, that's something that I've always wanted to do. I want to keep some white tree frogs in there with them. Now, okay. the only problem is, uh, you know, I would imagine if they cross paths, the Mertens are going to eat them, but I, I don't want that. So what I plan to do is I plan to put some uh, smaller uh, cork tubes in there, and then I'm going to take some PVC pipe and with the zoopox and make them look like uh, hollow branches, but set them in obscure places like where, you know, it's harder for a big lizard to get. So my, my hopes is that the frogs, you know, will stay hidden during the day and I'll come out at night when the lizards are sleeping. So that's just one more thing. I, you know, I don't really know that much about white tree frogs, but I'm looking into it, but I want to keep them in there with them, you know? Okay. But not if they get eaten, if they get eaten, I won't do it. Right. So uh, Scott, to kind of answer your question a, a little bit, kind of from my perspective, I guess, um, Mike actually is the example for a lot of us varanid nerds here in the States. Um, because we had heard for a long time from you guys in Australia that Mertens were cool. They, you know, weren't quite as big as the giant Asian waters, but they were, you know, easy to care for, so on and so forth. But we could never get them. And then a guy like Mike does, who all of us had known as a dude who had been really successful with all these different monitors. And then now he's proving what all of you Australian guys said, you know, he, he is having the success and is doing all these things. So it, it kind of isn't, it's not a missed out on thing. It's just that for uh, us in the U S we didn't have the opportunity. And then now that, we, now that we got the opportunity, one of our dudes who's good at it is the person who has been successful now. So it was, it's more just like us, realizing that what you guys were saying was true all along, you know, from the success that Australian folks have had. Right. And yeah, of course it, availability is huge with these animals, you know? Right. Um, I mean, I, I don't really follow all the laws and stuff like that, but back way back in the day when I was keeping all the New Guinea stuff, you know, there was other big people back then and you know it was always like where how does this guy got all this australia stuff australia's closed down right i mean so i mean i get it they were here at one point i don't know how far back that goes but man you're telling me all these generations of these animals have been here from only a few select that made it to this country what in the 50s i don't believe it 
somehow they're getting in, you know, and apparently they have been in legal, not legal. I don't know, but I'm glad they're here and I'm glad people are successful with them. So, you know, there is no pull on the population, like everything that's coming out of New Guinea and, you know, things are getting much better. Like there's a lot of good tree monitor breeders out there and uh, you know, they're doing great things with them, which is great. It's still that, that import market is still hell on animals because what it takes to produce these animals, you can't sell them for $300 to compete with a wild caught animal. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. And people they're coming around a little bit better now, but people don't realize what it takes for you to take that $300 wild caught animal and actually turn it into a captive bred specimen. You're, you're talking about, you know, years of, of, uh, you know, keeping them medicated, hydrated, you know, watching for infections, secondary infections, and somebody produces a captive born animal. Well, they have way more in it. And when you get a captive born animal, that's all gone. You, you pay, you pay more money for it, but you got nothing to worry about. They don't know, have, they don't have any outside parasites. They never had them. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're great. They're not, uh, uh, dehydrated. They don't know what the wild is. So when you put them in a shower stall and you deck it out, they're like, Oh, this is great. Mm-hmm. Where if you take one from the wild that knows no boundaries and real trees and real sun, and you throw them in a shower stall and expect them to do good, you're kidding yourself. And you're in for a long haul. It can be done. I've done it. It's, it's but it, it's not, you know, you can't compare, a $300 wild caught animal to a $900 captive born specimen, two totally different animals. You're going to have two different roads that they take you down. So the little bit of money you save on the front end is in, you're going to wind up with a dead animal if you don't do everything I just said. So it's going to cost you money to to get them up. Right. So that's real. It's, you know, like I said, with the success of, you know, Australians, there was never a competition with wild caughts with Australian animals. So back in the day, that was the place to be. But I wasn't, I still, I don't care about money. I really don't. All the money I get goes to my wife anyway. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't get the money. What I get to do is I get to do a little trading here and there and get what I want. And that's good. True. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it, it, you know, to put, to take pressure off wild caught is huge. Cause you know, for the most part, these animals deserve to be where they belong. You know, I'm going to say probably 75 or, and I'm being kind, 75% of these animals get the proper treatment. You know, the rest of them suffer slow, languishing, miserable deaths. And, and that's, that's horrible as, as an animal lover, that's horrible for sure. You know? So Scott says, if you want any pictures of in situ Mertens and habitats for inspiration, hit me up. So you should definitely take him up on that. I um, definitely will. <laughs> but since you, you brought up the difference between captive bred and wild caught, you, you were on the forums back in the day with me. So you might remember um, pro exotics. Did, oh, yeah. and they did incredibly well with black throats. And if you remember, yeah. I, I was in college and I, <laughs> I was trying to figure out the money to figure out how I was going to do it, but I, I wasn't able to, they, they, they moved their entire blackthroat colony out and stopped producing them because people fought them on the price for captive red animals, tooth and nail. And they were like, look, man, we, it's a business. Like we, we have to charge this much money, you know, just to make it feasible for the business. And pe- they just couldn't move the animals. And so right. they ended up, they gave up on the species totally from a business standpoint, like, yo, we just can't do it. Well, and to be completely honest with you too, going back in those days, um, you know, Robin and Chad, they were, they were, they were probably one of the first to um, produce green tree 
monitors in captivity in the United States back then. And, and oh, again, sure. and again, they got these animals and, you know, they're trying to get, you know, the proper money for them. And they're competing with, uh, um, you know, wild caught cheap stuff. And you, you, at that time you couldn't convince somebody, you know, why it was smarter to buy the captive born for all that much more money. You know, people think ah, I'm good enough. I can do this. Well, I can tell you right now, unless you're totally, totally dedicated to a wild caught animal, you're probably not going to do that well with it. Right. Well, and it, it always, it always got me with the tree monitors, especially, you know, you're already starting out with an animal that's made to be skinny, like small. It's, it's not a heavy bodied animal. So right. if they're dehydrated, if, if they have any kind of parasite that affects their, their stomach or, or digestion or anything like that animal doesn't have the fat stores to deal with it. You know, mm -hmm. you're as, as bad as it was, you know, when you'd see like import black throats and things come in, but like you, you bring in a four foot lizard from Mozambique, you know, there's some fat sitting in that thing, you know, and, oh, yeah. and it, it can kind of deal a little bit as you get your feet under you and figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing. Right. Dude, you bring in a green tree that already is a 10th the size of the other animal. And then it hasn't drank water in three days. Like you, yeah. you don't have a chance, you, you know? Yep. Yeah. And that's the key with the, with the Indo stuff. As soon as, you know, I mean, you're best off to get it as soon as it hits the shores, that's your best chance, you know, because like you even say with that Mozambique, the, um, <clears throat> The back, the black float uh, throat sitting over there with a fat store. Okay, like you say, you get it, and it and it has a fat store, so it it has, you know, a better chance than a already you know uh, emaciated out of season tree monitor. Like you know, a tree monitor in season when there's a lot of food available to it, it's going to be in better shape. Hopefully, when you get it. Then when you get one that's, you know, it's not in the rainy season, it really hasn't ate much in the wild, it gets caught. And to fill a quota, it's got to sit in a uh, concrete vat until there's, you know, 12 or 20 of them. And now he's already, lo he's losing more weight and they're not kept under the best conditions. Then they come overseas on a slow boat or however they get them here. Then with that Mozambique animal, he's, when he goes through that, he's got already a better fat store than like an out of season tree monitor he is sure. you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah. That, and, that, and that's the problem with these imported animals, you know, they're the people on the other end don't care. It's not that they don't care. It's a commodity. It, it's money to them. So uh, I just wish they would realize and take better care of them maybe, and they could get more money, you know, whatever the case may be. And that's the thing, like there are in the US at least, like there are a couple of importers that that are serious about it. And and man, you can tell. Yeah. You know, it, it, those animals come in and you know, they're they're not going to be hand tame or whatever, like they're still wild animals, but like you can you can literally just even the pictures they post. You look at that animal and it's like, "All right, he probably needs an extra mouse or two, like he's a little thin." But it is night and day difference from 10 years ago. You'd see and, picture, you know, they didn't want to show you a picture. They just right. send you a written list like, hey, man, uh, you don't want to know. But, but you know, back in the day, you got that written list and you're like, OK, you know, you got you had no other choice. You have to right. either take the chance or forget it. Yep. But you're right. They, You know, once they get here, they are getting treated a lot better. They're, they're doing better. And but if you've noticed those um, better end wholesalers, that guys out there that take care of and, you know, feed and hydrate their animals, maybe even, you know, flagellant panicure them, they may want a little bit more. Oh, yeah. And, and the common public will still go for $100 cheaper. Yeah. It's so frustrating. It's like you don't realize what that $100 is going to save you. Right. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Um, so we're getting – toward the end of time here, but I did want to ask before I let you go um, okay. for heating and lighting. Yes. What do you, what are you doing? Are you a UV guy or are you not a UV guy? What, what do you, where do you stand here? 
I look, I know a lot of people in the business and I'm not bashing nobody's product. Do what you want. I've never used UVB or UVA or UV anything when, you know, I was, I'm from a time when there was no UVB lights or UVA lights, or they may have claimed them, but there was no study behind them or anything. So I'm a halogen guy. I like halogen bulbs. Um, you know, proper vitamins and supplements with high heat. It, 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 um, processes calcium and, and, you know, D3 processes the calcium. Everything's good that way. So I never, I, I'm not knocking it. I, and if you want to use it, use it. The thing that ruined me on UVB and UVA and all that stuff is, okay, well, it's got to be, you know, 18 inches and then it's worth this percentage. And after six months, it goes down to this percentage. And, you know, at the end of eight months, you replace it. You're talking about $50 bulbs. You know what I mean? I, I replace the way I replace bulbs on here. If I was doing UVB, those peach, uh, those uh, Merton's monitors, they'd be 10,000 a piece. Right. To recover something. So I never bought into it because of their own, you know, I don't know if it's what they legally had to market, you know, the actual results of, you know, so far away, um, you know, for so long, and then you need to replace it. That sounds to me like a, you know, good marketing scheme. And I'm just, I, I can't afford it. I got too much and I'm just not falling into it. However, when I did have that garage door open, it opened with the sunlight beaming in. Okay. Can't beat it. I, I am working on getting some um, uh, enclosures that I could bring my animals outside. Actually, I have two windows in my room in the basement, and I kind of want to make because um, I do all kinds of stupid stuff like this. I want to make little shoots that link up to each enclosure. So in the summertime, all I got to do is open a chute, let the animal crawl out the window into the sun cage, close it off, let the next one into the next cage, you know, um, kind of like a shoot system. Nice. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you might remember uh, King Snakes forums back in the day, Frank Reitz. Mm. Yes. He, he did, he did the same idea where, um, where he lived. He had the same idea where he would open a door and they could go outside. And um, he, he was doing the same thing because j just like us, he had a really crappy winter. So, he could only do it part of the year. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as, you know, um, uh, I, I don't know if, if it's, I'm probably wrong, but fake UV, it's, I don't think there's a need for it. Real UV for outside. I don't think you can really beat it, you know, um, actual sun. But like you say here, with the shitty winters, if I can get them out there, you know, two, three months for right. some you know, natural sunlight and let them in, I'm sure that would help tremendously. And then and as, far, as far as heating, I heat, um, I use the, the, um, the ambient temperature of the room, 84 degrees is like my base. Um, basking spots are jacked up with the halogen lights and um, nesting areas are heated with uh, cane heat mats and I press them against the side of the tub. And I do this for a couple of reasons. I, I, you know, you don't want to put way, I know people that do, but I personally don't want to burn my house down. So I'm not going to put a 300 gallon tub of dirt on top of a cane heat mat. Although I guess pigs lay on them and stuff, but they're not on them constantly, you know? So I put them on the side and why I put them on the side is, you know, as, as the monitors are searching their enclosure, they feel that at the wall. Now, when they start digging for nesting or wherever, they'll always dig where the soil goes, you know, there's temperature gradient. So it's just easier for me to put it on the side. It's safer and it's much easier for them to find because, you know, as they're digging, it, it's, and I've gotten into this with people before, and I use the terminology like this here. And I can only go by here when it's hot out and your dog's out in the backyard and the sun is baking. What does that sucker do? He digs a hole. He, he goes deeper in the ground to cool off. Well, I'm sure that's the same way all over the world. You don't normally dig down and it becomes warmer. 
So that's why I've always used side heating rather than under, you know, maybe if it was a nest box or something like that, you could get away with it. But in these big, uh, big tubs that I have, they wouldn't even know it was down there because it's not going to penetrate to the surface. You know what I'm saying? Sure. The so, surface should be hotter and the lower should be cooler as you go. So you aren't actually doing a specific nest box. You're letting them just do it in the actual enclosure substrate. Yeah. Whole cage nesting is okay. uh, whole cage nesting is what I've always used. Uh, you can probably, I guess you can call my Mertens a nest box because that upper level where the big slab, I have that big slab up there. That's um, Zupoxy over insulation boards. And I have a little access hole in there. It looks like a, a rocky crevice. They squeeze through there. And when they get through that little uh, rocky crevice, they're in the nest box that's heated. And that, that nest box there, those Mertens, I keep them suckers hot. That nest box, the surface area under the shelf is got to be 90, 90 degrees at the surface. And as they dig down and towards the heat mat, they can get hotter or cooler depending on, you know, what they're looking for. It's usually 86 degrees they're looking for. Wow. Yeah. And then um, are you using anything specifically to measure temperature, humidity, that kind of thing? Or are you just, you know, plain old thermometer no, we all have? Really like like I could, I could turn on my faucet, put my finger under it, tell you how hot it is, check it with the temp gun, and that's how hot it is. I just been doing it for so long, I could kind of tell the temperature with my finger. Um, but yeah, I use I use um, temp guns for surface temperatures, and as far as uh, ambient air temperatures, I just have one you know, uh, I don't know, temperature gauge, like a, the kind you'd hang outside your kitchen window. I okay. keep that in my room. And as long as it's reading 84 degrees, I'm good. Right. So that's, that's it. But the, the temp gun you need. For sure. And then um, to maintain that 84 ambient, you said, are you using a space heater for that? Or are you using home heat or how, how are you doing that? Well, see, here's the thing. Um, we have a, a wood burning stove that we heat our house with. So our, we rarely put our furnace on. Okay. So that's why I run the space heaters. But in times when we do, like when it gets 30 below here and the wife kicks the uh, furnace on, the heaters go off because, you know, it maintains that. But I always maintain 84. So while we're burning with the stove, that does not penetrate the basement at all. So I run uh, a couple little space heaters. In my uh, cockroach room, I have a radiator uh, heater, plug-in kind, and I keep that room. That's easily 90 degrees. So, Okay. Yeah. And then since you brought up roaches, specific kind, you're, what, are you, what are you doing there? How are you? Well, back in the day, I tell people this all the time. When uh, Remember Fear Factor? Yeah. Okay. Well, they used to buy about 20,000 roaches a month off of me. And that back in the day, I made so much money with cockroaches. And, you know, when I first started, there was maybe a couple people that had like, you know, pet hissers and stuff like that. Well, I started buying colonies from people and I wouldn't do nothing with them. I just set them up in my cockroach room and I left them be. I took care of them, left them be. And before I know it, I'm overrun. I was doing nine species. And I'm telling you, I produced. I kept uh, fear factor going and endless customers. And I always thought in the back of my head, man, one of these days, somebody's going to catch on. They're going to buy one of my colonies and they're just going to put it up. They're not going to, you know, feed out of it. They're going to put it up. And of course it didn't take long. I think about three years into it, you know, before you know it, everybody was breeding them. But yeah, I do. I my favorite species of cockroach is um, uh, Blabberus cranifer, the true death head. That's just a beautiful, beautiful roach. They they have a, a Dracula head on their uh, their protonum on the back of their head there. Yep. And and the black wings. It's just a beautiful, beautiful cockroach. And of course, hissers. I, I used a hundred percent hissers with my tree monitors. I fed them 
so many hissers at the right size. They were mm, probably half grown. And I always use the cylinder shaped ones, not the flat coin type ones, the ones that look like half of your finger. Okay. And yeah, I would gut load them. And man, you could see that one picture of me eating that big hisser, right? Yeah. That's fake. That that's mustard and mayonnaise I put on my beard, but they were juicy. They were juicy like that for the lizards. Um Sorry to burst everyone's bubble out there. That's a fake photo. Yeah, man, <laughs> but, you should have kept that going. I should have kept it going. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> people can believe what they want. A lot of people say that anyways. But, yeah, I, I just got another colony of uh, hissers going. Nice. So I have I have hissers. I have um, the death heads. I have discoids. I have dubia. Uh, what else do I have? I got another species there. Oh, and I got giant cave roaches. Okay. So I, 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 I feed them, uh, but I, I just like keeping the roaches. It's kind of like part and parcel with the lizards, you know, for sure. And then, so do you, do you mix and match all those as feeders or some of them you're just keeping to keep or. No, I, I feed, they're all feeders. Yeah. Okay. They're, except I shouldn't say that except the giant cave roaches. They're so slow breeding for me anyways, that I just keep them and grow them. And, you know, if I ever get, enough to start feeding them off i will but the way the way i have them right now i started with like um 10 nymphs and two adults and now i probably got uh, um dozen adults and a bunch of nymphs so i want to keep that going they seem to be a little slower breeding for me they like a lot of protein um but yeah they're cool they're big they freak people out and i love them yeah yeah and that, see, that's that's something I don't think a lot of new people probably realize either, especially when you start talking about monitor lizards in general, and especially being hardcore insectivores, man. Like, roaches are an absolute necessity. It, it, for the stuff that I keep, like, I just couldn't do it with crickets and mealworms. I don't, th I don't think I could buy enough. Like, I couldn't afford it. Yeah, you, you, in the breed, that stuff, I, I hate opening a box with all them little flies in there. So yeah, it's a nightmare. You know, people think roaches, ugh, they're, they're, my roaches are clean. There's no fruit flies. There's, there's, they're clean. They, they don't smell. They're, I mean, if you keep them right, just like, I guess, anything else, you know, um, but yeah, you need all those insects and what a better insect. I mean, you could control, you know, how you gut load it, how much you, you know, uh, cause what you're giving to your roaches, you're giving to your, um, your, your, your animals, your lizards. So Absolutely. Um, you have a lot of control over what you put into your animals. But uh, what I've noticed is with these larger monitors that, um, you know, rodents are just, you know, I see these big, huge uh, monitors out there and I know what they're all on the edge of like uh, fatty liver, you know, they're walking around with huge fat stores that they don't need. And eventually they will have kidney failure because of it or whatever, you know, it, the, 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 the symptom or the result is. Um, so to combat that with these larger monitors that, you know, you get a five foot coming eye, he looks at a giant hissing roach and he's like, wow, dude, you can't be for real. You got about a thousand more of those. Yep. So I've really been doing heavy uh, quails. Quails are, are they give them they give them a, a lot of protein minus a lot of the fat. And when you do give them like um, day olds or uh, the balutes, I call them like eggs with the embryo in there. It's actually a foreign bird, but they yep. may still have some yolk sac. So that's how they get their fat store and it's not too much. So that seems to be working out really good for me. Um, a heavy quail diet that, you know, some rodents mixed in some insects, a uh, fish, chopped fish. Um, but that that's pretty much what I use is quail, quail egg, um, some mice, uh, maybe some rats, you know, depending if I can get them good deal on them, but uh, very limited with the rodents on all of my animals. Yep. I just started breeding button quail for that exact same reason. Yeah. There you go. Well, you, when you get an egg a day, right? 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine that? So um, I know a few people that are breeding them, and they keep me supplied, so they must have a huge flock of them. How many right. do you have, Bill? So I won 100 eggs at a charity auction, and I – um, I'm getting the eggs in 25 chunks. And so I did my first 25. I fed off a couple and um, the folks who donated the eggs donated shipping the first go round. And then in to in return for shipping the rest of my stuff for free, I've been doing little videos for them. So okay. I, fed, I fed off a few of the eggs and, and kind of explained why quail and eggs are a good reptile food because this company is kind of trying to break into that and get out of the away from the poultry for humans and they want poultry for pets kind of thing. So I was right. just did some videos for them. And so I have um, seven adults right now. And then I have another 20, 28 or 29 eggs incubating right now. I wow. fed off, I fed off most of the, the first ones doing the videos and stuff. And I actually incubated quite a few uh, all the way to the end. And then, like you were saying, with the fully formed bird inside the egg, I fed that off because I have a couple of snakes that are nest raiders. And so I wanted them to get all that calorie intake. Right. And Can't um, beat them well. yeah, man, it, it was awesome. So here, yeah. here in about two weeks, my first set should start producing eggs. And then that second set of 25, I'm incubating the whole set. And they've got about three or four more days to go before they start hatching. So they'll be here for eight weeks until they feather out and can deal with it themselves. And then right. they'll go, they'll go in with the other set. So I should have like 30, 32 birds. Um, and then we're going to see what comes out for the sex ratio and start getting eggs and figure it out. Yep. I was doing quails for a little while. I soon got out of them because man, I, I just, with all the things I had going, I was doing rodents and roaches and then the monitors. I couldn't keep up with the quails, but if you ever bored sitting around, you ain't got nothing to do. Throw a handful of crickets in there for them things. Watch what they do. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and put the if you can put the Benny Hill music on. Yeah. You know, make oh, a yeah. video of that. It's hilarious. Yeah, they they move with a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. They're like little raptors themselves. You know, they're like little dinosaurs. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we started having the problem of I didn't know, and I I did my research, and they had said that you know you need to deal with um, having things that are really hard over top of their head. Cause if they get scared, they fly straight up in the air. Right. And they can, they can brain themselves and like get yeah. seriously injured. Yeah. And so our first set, you know, it, it took that eight weeks for them to feather out to where that, you know, they couldn't fly or anything. And so, okay, we're going to move them to the coop that we set up and we're doing button quail. So they're really small. Right. So I'm keeping them indoors in my facility with oh, downstairs with all the turtles and we, we put these things in and they're running around doing what they're doing. And I wasn't even thinking about it. So I just went and started filling turtle waters and doing whatever I do. And when I come walking back around, I must've surprised them. And it's seven little birds straight up in the air. And all you heard was the machine gun thump, 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 thump off the roof. <laughs> And then they're just kind of wandering around days. And I was like, oh, my God, we might have just killed these birds day one. Like, so did you put a net over the top? So so we um, – I ended up putting them – so it's it's like kind of like a double-level chicken coop to where the, okay. the idea is the chickens would walk up top, lay in the box, and you can open the box and pull eggs and stuff. Right. So I just, I just closed that off so they can't even get in there. And then the rest of it is wide open and we put hay on the bottom and stuff so they can scratch and do all the bird stuff that they do. Um, but that is high enough up in the air that they aren't hitting it. The right. Problem, I got it. The problem was they were inside that little chicken lay area. They saw me and just shot right up into that roof. Well, that roof was only about 15 inches above their head. So they yeah. didn't make it too far and they just thumped right off it. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah. yeah they're cool. Yeah. <sighs> All right, man. So we're like hour 45. So we're going to wrap things up. If folks want to find you and see your stuff, where can they find Mike's monitors at? Well, you can go to Mike's monitors.com. Uh, I have a, um, my webpage there. Um, if you go to every individual picture of the species and you click on it there, you'll find information on that species. Um, 
you know, basic needs and husbandry, stuff like that. Um, I'm going to be working on that a little more. I'm also working on a YouTube channel as soon as I can figure out how to work a GoPro. I'm low tech, so I got to have my kids help me. Um, <laughs> and you, you can find me at Mike's Monitors on Facebook, Mike's Monitors on Instagram, or Mike Stefani on Facebook. And uh, all my sale ads are either in Morph Market or uh, Fauna Classifieds. <clears throat> And for folks that are listening, um, you heard Mike and I talk about forums and stuff and all the things that we did back in the day. Um, if you actually go to kingsnake.com, you can still look in the forums there and you can still look at the FAQs and stuff and see some of the things that we're talking about and the yeah. people that had success in the past and the things that they've done. Um, you'd be surprised how much of it really hasn't changed. Right. It's, just, it's just that folks kind of stopped keeping the things. So a lot right. of the guys that are coming back or the guys that have still been here the whole time are, are still using a lot of the same techniques they had success with before. So you can look at those older forums and, and read the things that they did and it should still work for you today. Right. And, and again, with, with Varanids, I, I say the best thing is you don't overwork it. Don't overthink it. Just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's about heat um, basking hydration and feed, feed them up, keep them nice and hot. <clears throat> um, the, you know, depending on the species, I, I, my Gillians, their ambient temperatures are, you know, 90 plus they are hot and they bask in For 90 sure. degrees. They still go up under 150 and lay there. It's just, it's crazy. Those Australian suckers like it hot. So yeah, heat feed. Don't overthink it. Um, your New Guinea stuff, your tropical stuff. Hydration is key. Um, uh, yeah, and you know that's that's about it. I just say don't overthink it. And uh, for anybody who is old school and out there, th there's a photo I have from way back in the day. Uh, I found all my old photos, and I have them all except this one photo. It's a male Varana similis. And it's sitting in a, a C type. Um, you, you can see it's full body. It's kind of a close up. It's kind of like coiled in a C. If anybody could find that and send it to me and I can save it, I'll give you a free Mertens monitor. So there's a so, challenge for anybody who knows how to play with tech stuff. So for everybody listening that just started clicking furiously to search for that picture, that just became a. That became a very desirable piece of content. Well, first person who can get that thing saved onto my phone, I will give you a free Mertens monitor. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right, man. So third episode, I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, it was great, Bill. Thank you. And uh, I can't wait till this COVA is over and I can see you guys out at the shows and stuff and, you know, have face-to-face -face talks, you know. For sure. All right. Thanks, man. Have a good night. Okay, buddy. Take care. I'll talk to you. Bye now. All right. That was episode three. Appreciate everybody tuning in and we will see you in two weeks.